Hello, my dear friends. Today, we are going to talk about the first naval battle of Narvik, which was fought from April 10th to April 13th, 1940. The ice-free harbor of Narvik was very important for Germany because it was used to transport iron ore from the neighboring Swedish deposits by rail and ship it by sea. During the winter months, when ice blocked Swedish harbors on the Baltic Sea, Narvik was the only harbor for the removal of iron ore and other vital raw materials for the war industry. That's why the battles here were so intense. Traditionally, we will look at the memoirs of the battle participant. This time, it is a British sailor, Cyril Cope. This video was sponsored by a free online game, World of Warships. The types of warships that are presented in this video are, of course, available in the game, too. World of Warships is not just a game. It's a floating digital museum displaying breathtaking recreations of not just the most fearsome vessels of the First and Second World Wars, but also many blueprints and designs of ships that never saw battle. These ships have been given new life in the game's virtual dockyards. New content is released every month, whether it's new ships, in-game nations, cosmetics, or even ship classes. You can always count on enjoying fresh gameplay experiences in World of Warships' stunning 12v12 arenas. During registration, use the code WARSHIPS to get exclusive rewards including a bunch of doubloons, credits, premium account time, and a free ship after you complete 15 battles. Believe me, 15 battles are not enough to enjoy the amazing graphics of the game. Dynamic weather effects and historically genuine ships from 10 countries will immerse you in the atmosphere of incredible naval battles. Experience new emotions with World of Warships. Well, let us begin. My name is Cyril Cope, and this is the story of my experiences in the Battles of Narvik on the 10th and 13th April 1940. One evening in the first week of April 1940, my ship HMS Hardy, in company with Hotspur, Hunter, and Havelock, left the Shetland Isles to escort some E-class destroyers, which had been converted to mine layers. Our captain informed us that we were on our way to the Norwegian coast, where the mines would be laid, and we would patrol for 24 hours to warn neutral shipping of the newly laid minefield. On arrival at our destination, a stretch of sea between the Norwegian coast and some small islands near the entrance of the fjord which led to the iron ore port of Narvik, the mines were laid and we started our patrol. That evening of the 8th of April, we received a signal from a destroyer further to the south. She was HMS Glowworm, and she was being attacked by the German heavy cruiser the Admiral Hipper. We set off for the position she had given, but due to rough seas and a very fierce snowstorm, we couldn't travel at full speed and when we got there, there was no sign of either the hipper or the glowworm. We searched for survivors, but only found debris, so we turned back towards Vestfjord and were fortunate to meet up with the battlecruiser HMS Renown. With her leading our flotilla and the mine layers, we stated to search for enemy ships, especially the hipper. All hands had been at action stations from the moment we had set off to find the glowworm, but had now reverted to normal watchkeeping. I had the middle watch, midnight to 0400, and my station was the forward torpedo tubes. It was a very cold position, even with all the extra clothing we had to put on. At 0345 hours, our thoughts of warm hammocks were rudely disturbed by the sound of shells passing over our head and falling into the sea on our port side. The action station alarm bells caused confusion to the waking sailors, who thought it was our usual stand to exercise. Here I must explain that, in ships during wartime, all hands would go to action stations at dusk and dawn to be ready for a sudden attack by the enemy. Since dawn was 0345 hours in this part of the world, you can see why everyone was confused. By this time, I and my companions on the torpedo tubes were moving out to starboard, where we could see two ships well down on the horizon. We saw the flashes from their guns and almost immediately heard the 15-inch guns of the HMS Renown fire in salvos at the enemy ships. We saw some hits and wondered how soon it would be before the Admiral in Renown gave our captain the order to make a torpedo attack. The Germans were heading on a parallel course to us, which was to the south. The sea was very rough, and it was still snowing very hard. Although I had received an order on my headphones from the bridge to cut down the guardrails ready for firing the torpedoes, we could not make an attack because of the rough seas which had reduced our speed. The Admiral, realizing we could not keep up with him or the enemy ships because of the bad weather, gave our captain the order to give up the chase and return to the entrance of Vestfjord to watch for any enemy ships approaching the fjord with the intention of going up to Narvik. 
We complied with the order, but our captain told the mine layers to return to the UK, leaving just our four ships to start the search. On arrival at Vestfjord, we were soon joined by HMS Hostel, one of our flotilla. Her arrival coincided with a visit to the pilot station by Lieutenant Heppel and Paymaster Lieutenant Stanning, Hardy's officers, to inquire if any German ships had passed up the fjord. They were told that at least six destroyers and one U-boat had gone up the night before. When they returned with this news, the captain decided to enter the fjord at noon, get to Narvik as quickly as possible, attack the enemy ships, land a raiding party, and capture the town. He thought surprise would win the day, but what he didn't know was that ten German ships much larger than our own and three thousand Alpine troops were already in and around Narvik. He was soon to find this out when he sent officers to the pilot station to ask if one of them would navigate them up the fjord. They said, no, not at any price. Tell your captain to go away and come back with much more and larger ships. The German destroyers are bigger than yours and have larger guns. Whilst this was going on, arrangements were being made for the 25 men under the command of an officer from each ship to land. We were dressed in blue suits, webbing belt and gaiters and had a pack on our backs with rations for three days. Bully beef, bread, ship's biscuits, and any chocolates or sweets we could scrounge from the galley. We also had a blanket in our packs, and before the dash up the fjord commenced, we were given a mug of neat rum. We mustered at the galley for this, and my messmate Tony Hart drank his, and I drank mine. We were just in time because the officer of the watch came into the galley and ordered the cook to stop serving rum. Because the attack had been called off until midnight, because of the information given by the pilots. We then headed off to sea and out of sight of land so that anybody watching would think we had departed for good. At 2300 hours we made our way to the entrance of Vestfjord, entering it near midnight. It was very cold, snowing hard, and we were closed up at action stations with only the engines running. All of the other machinery had been stopped. We could not move about to keep warm and were only allowed to speak in whispers. The only light visible was a blue one on the aftermast to guide the following ships. We and Hardy had no light to follow, but relied solely on our navigating officer, Lieutenant Commander Smith, to guide us and the rest of our four ships up the fjord to Narvik Harbor. This was a feat hard enough in daylight, but in darkness it seemed impossible. However, despite some near misses with the cliffs on the port side of the fjord, which we had to keep close to in order to avoid U-Boat 51, which was submerged at the entrance to the fjord, but on the starboard side. Apparently, this U-boat had reported seeing us head out to sea earlier in the day, and the captain had made a signal to Commodore Bont, senior officer German destroyers, on the Wilhelm Heidkamp. So Bont did not expect the attack which was about to take place, because the U-boat was unaware that we had re-entered the fjord. Luck was with us. At 0345 hours, we arrived at the entrance to Narvik Harbor. It was still snowing, and dawn was about to break. The German sailors, except for the sentries on watch, would be asleep. Our captain detailed two destroyers to check another fjord close by. The other two stayed outside of the harbor on guard as we went in alone. On our port side was a large British iron ore ship, the Blythmoor, which had been captured by the enemy the previous night. Two German sailors were on guard in the upper deck, but when guns were pointed at them, they scampered down a hatch without giving any alarm. We were laid almost alongside the ship with only a few feet between us, our engines were just turning over slowly, and away on our starboard side, not very far away, I could see through the swirling snow and mist several ships, mostly transports or iron ore ships. But there were also five German destroyers, two of which were tied up to an oil tanker, which we later found out was the Jan Willem. The pipes were still in position to provide the oil, and except for the two sentries, the Germans had no idea that we were in the harbor. They soon found out, because the order to fire torpedoes came down from the bridge, because our tubes were already trained on the starboard side, the four torpedoes from them were the first shots fired in the First Battle of Narvik. The first one hit and sank the Wilhelm Heidkamp. Commodore Bont, the senior officer in command of all the German destroyers, was asleep in his sea cabin, and he and most of the ship's company were killed or wounded. The second and third torpedoes hit the Anton Schmidt in the magazine. When the ship blew up, the explosion severely damaged the destroyer Hermann Kuhn, and the fourth torpedo hit a large transport. We then trained our tubes fore and aft and went to the assistance of the after-tubes crew who were having difficulties training their tubes to starboard. Here I will explain. When the destroyer is in an area where it is likely to meet the enemy, one set of torpedo tubes are trained to port and one set to starboard, because which side the attack may take place is unknown. 
and getting the tubes to bear as quickly as possible is essential if you want to get the first shot in. On this occasion, my tubes were ready on the correct side. The after set were not, and it was very hard to rectify this because of the ice packed around the traversing gear. We had almost reached the position where a large steel bolt would engage in a hole in the iron deck to lock the tubes into position when the officer on the bridge electrically fired the first torpedo. The tubes swung violently, but lucky for us, in the direction of the locking position. Numbers two and three torpedoes fired, one of them hitting the iron ore jetty. But the delay in getting into position prevented number four from being fired. By this time, the captain had ordered full steam ahead, and we turned to starboard, towards the entrance of the harbor, and on our way out, he signaled the other ships to go in and attack with torpedoes only. This they did, except for hostile, who for some unknown reason did not fire any. The four ships followed us down the fjord, but not very far, because on my headphones I heard the captain say, We have done a good job, but we must go back and do some more. We turned back on our course into the harbor moving very fast, and we began firing all our guns, doing much damage to destroyers and enemy transports as well as the iron ore ships taken over by the Germans. We did not stop, but made our way out of the harbor with the other ships following us after they had fired their guns. Down the fjord we sped to what we thought would be the open sea, and maybe home. It was not to be. Once again, I heard the captain say, We did a lot more damage, but now we must go back, and this time we will be staying. All men selected for the landing party get ready. Here I must explain what had happened during our previous attacks. In the first one, because we had not fired our guns, the Germans had thought it was an air attack, so when we went in for the second time, they were firing anti-aircraft guns into the sky. We could see the puffs like cotton wool as they exploded in the sky. In both attacks, we were not fired on, so there was no damage to any of our ships. However, on our third approach to the harbor, they did fire at us. Guns and torpedoes were fired, but because the firing pistols on their torpedoes were not designed for use in high altitudes, they passed under us without exploding. We could not get into the harbor as there was fire and oil on the water. Ships were on fire and some were sinking. We all fired our shells through the entrance at the enemy. And then we turned to get on our way down the fjord. As we cleared the entrance, we could see three enemy destroyers bearing down on us from Hurrying's fjord. They were firing at us from our starboard quarter, and we could only bring our aftergun to bear in reply as we sped down the fjord with them in pursuit. The ships were Wolfgang Zenker, Eric Geis, and the Eric Kolnar. They had been unloading their complement of Alpine troops and equipment and were anchored for the night prior to going into harbor to fill up with oil. A signal had been sent to them about our attack. They had got steam up and weighed anchor just in time to meet us leaving the harbor mouth. Our captain had ordered a speed of 30 knots, which would have taken us well clear of these ships and out to sea. It was still very misty and snow was falling, but through this heavy mist two large ships were sighted passing across our bow. The captain and others on the bridge thought they might have been two of our small cruisers coming to assist us, so he sent a signal, Are you the Penelope and the Cleopatra? They did not reply, but started to fire full salvos at us. Hardy, being the leader, came in for a lot of heavy punishment. We turned to port, and at this point the fjord opened out to what looked like a lake, which gave us a bit of room for maneuvering. A full salvo hit our bridge, killing or severely wounding all the personnel. A shell hit the wheelhouse, and the chief coxswain who was on the wheel was killed, which meant that the ship was momentarily out of control. His body was holding the wheel hard over to port, so we circled. The other ships followed in our wake, partly covered by a smokescreen from our funnels. Lieutenant Stanning, who had been wounded in the foot, managed to get down from the bridge to the wheelhouse and was able to take over the wheel. He then told a young able seaman to take over, and at that moment a salvo hit the starboard side below the wheelhouse. One shell went through the canteen, and then into the TS, transmitting station, where the guns were controlled. On its way, it hit my mate Bill Pimlet, who was standing by the door leading into the TS, and then chopped off the legs of two of the TS operators, Abel Seaman Werdy and leading Seaman Coquin. They were sitting on high stools at the console which contained the instruments. The two operators opposite were not wounded when the shell exploded. They each picked up a wounded mate and carried them onto the iron deck to set them on their stumps against the forward funnel. There was nothing they could do for Bill Pimlet, because there was not much left of him. Shells also hit our two forward guns, killing or wounding some of the gun's crew. But the one that took the worst of the shelling was Sea Gun, between the two funnels. It was completely wrecked, and all the gun's crew were killed. One shell of the salvo hit the main steam pipe in the boiler room. This cut off the steam to the engines, and as the ship lost speed, 
Lieutenant Stanning gave the order to steer towards the shore. This was approved by Lieutenant Heppel, who had then reached the bridge after checking that after the steering position was operational, when he had feared that the main steering was not functioning, this was when Coxwin was killed and there was nobody on the wheel. The ship drifted ashore until it grounded. The Germans were still firing at us. I had been in my action station on the tubes from midnight through the action in the harbor and the fjord, and up to ten minutes before the ship grounded. After all our torpedoes had fired, I had two other jobs to perform at action stations. Firstly, I had to stay near the tubes with my headphones on, and if I had received an order from the bridge to make smoke, I would have to run into the forecastle or the quarterdeck to ignite a smoke float which emitted thick, white, sickly-tasting smoke. This would then give ourselves and other ships a screen behind which we or they could hide from the enemy. I was therefore in a good position to watch all the action taking place. The high-speed maneuvering of all the ships, the gun flashes, and the torpedoes being fired at us by the enemy. I saw Hunter and Hotspur hit, and I knew we were being hit forward, but nothing would come in board from the after funnel to the stern. My mate, Bill Pimlet, was with me to share the job of making smoke. We were making black smoke from both funnels, so the order that we were expecting did not come. Bill said, I'm going forward to make a cup of tea and I'll bring you one. I said, with all that stuff coming in board forward, you had better be careful. Crawl on your belly along the iron deck until you reach the canteen flat. He did so, but as he stood outside the canteen in T.S., he was hit by the shell, which went through his back and out of his stomach. I only learnt of this from one of the survivors of the T.S., when we eventually reached the house into which we all crowded after swimming ashore. When Bill left me, I tried to get a response from the bridge. When I heard nothing, there was nobody alive up there to hear me, I decided to go to my next action station in the engine room. Here I had my bag of tools, and my job was to stand by in case there was any electrical damage. I was the engineer commander and the warrant engineer for five minutes when the engines packed up. We all looked at each other, and the commander said, This is it. We have had it. He told me to go to the upper deck and find out what was happening. The ship was gliding towards the shore. I went up the ladder, and as I opened the hatch, the first lieutenant was bending down to open it. I noticed that he had smoke coming from his pistol, and I thought, Good God, he's gone off his head and shot somebody. I was about to drop back down the ladder when he said, Cope, tell the engineer commander it's every man for himself. Abandon ship. I went down the ladder fast, gave the message, and led the way back up the ladder with the officers and the engine staff following. The Germans were still firing, but only one of our guns was replying. Their crew would just not give in. Our chief stoker, Stiles, was helping to launch a small boat in which to take the captain ashore. It was the only serviceable boat. We called it a skimming dish. A shell hit the boat and exploded, wounding the men trying to launch it. The chief stoker was severely wounded, but he and the captain, as well as our other wounded men, were towed ashore on the stretchers or life rafts. When I reached the upper deck, I went to my abandoned ship station, which was a raft near the searchlight platform. Some of the men who should have been on that raft had been killed. I and four others lifted it up, and after cutting it free, we took it to the ship's side and dropped it into the water. Unfortunately, the man who was supposed to tie the rope that attached the raft to the stanchion had not done so. Instead, he had thrown it into the raft, which then floated away into the fjord. By this time, my petty officer West had joined me at the guardrails. He said, It looks like we'll have to swim for it, Cope. I climbed over ready to drop into the water. I had taken off my cap, overcoat, gloves, scarf, and even my backpack, which I had kept with my shoes ready for the landing. I looked forward in time to see a whaler being lowered. It looked in good condition the only boat to be so at this stage, or so we thought. Unfortunately, the men at one end were stokers, and as the boat started to move, they let it go and the bows hit the water very hard. The coxswain of the whaler and a couple of wounded men were in it, and I thought they would surely be killed, or at least tossed into the water. However, they were okay, and as the boat moved away from the ship's side, I dropped into the water after saying to the P.O., There is our ride ashore, Mick. As I swam to the whaler of the coxswain, Jack Waters, one of my messmates, saw me coming and pulled me into the boat. He then went to pull the P.O. in, but just then it turned over throwing us into the water, so that we ended up underneath the boat. There were seven or eight of us cursing and thrashing about trying to get out from under it. The boat then turned over again, just as we had managed to lay across the keel to catch our breath. It did this a few times, and each time we managed to lie on top of the keel. One or two of the men swam ashore and eventually there was only myself and Lieutenant Fullwood, our Asditch officer left on the keel. He said, I'm off, Cope, and away he went. I went under for the last time, and when I surfaced and got back onto the keel, I looked towards the shore. The shells from the German ships, which had been falling on the shoreline, had stopped. I decided to slide off the boat and swim. 
As I did, I heard a shout for help coming from the direction of the ship. I looked back to see a messmate, Tony Hart, in the water with the life buoy around his body. I knew he was a non-swimmer, and he was not even trying to paddle with his hands. I realized that he was going to be swept down the fjord and drown or freeze to death if he did not make it to the shore. I swam back to him, about twenty yards, and grabbed a hold of a lanyard attached to the life buoy and started to swim with my right arm pulling him to the shore. I could not use my legs, could not even feel them because of the coldness of the water. Slowly but surely we got nearer the shore. My divisional officer, Lieutenant Heppel, passed me twice towing non-swimmers. He was a very strong swimmer, and the second time he passed me he shouted, Keep going, Cope. You will soon be able to stand up and walk ashore. Very soon I could, although my feet were so cold I didn't feel them touch bottom. Well, let me remind you that if you want to immerse yourself in the atmosphere of amazing naval battles, then play World of Warships. During registration, use the code WARSHIPS to get exclusive rewards, including a bunch of doubloons, credits, premium account time, and a free ship after you complete 15 battles. Happy hunting, Captain!